Good evening, everybody. We're ready to launch into the next section of Tanya. And uh, in this, we're going to look at one of the areas of human life that is quite convenient. And that is that the human being is a layered being, which means that what you see is not necessarily what you get about a person. The first time you catch a glimpse of a person, they walk into the room, you've never seen them before. So you immediately get an impression of them based on their external looks, something very superficial, simply how they appear at first glance. And even though it is human nature to make quick judgments and decide what type of person that person is just based on that first glance, but we know from experience that people are not just that. People are much more than that. They have more to them. They have more layers to them. And you can't really know a person just by a one-off glance. You get to know them through conversation, through experience, through spending time together. And so the per a human being is a layered being that we get to meet new layers as we spend more time with a person. One of the handy things about that is that there is somewhat of control we have over the layers that we reveal to others. Not everything about us is on display is there for the taking, for anybody to look at, observe, and, and know about us. There's things about us that we keep to ourselves. And that's because our physical self is present, is, is visible, is open to whoever may see us. The words we say, we choose to say. Most of the time, what we talk about, what we reveal about ourselves is a conscious decision. We say what we want to whom we want. But what we think, is nobody's business. What we think is kept within ourselves. Unless we choose to say what we think, what we think, as we're thinking it, is internal, is within me, nobody else sees or hears or knows about it. And that, if you think about it, is quite a relief. Because if our thoughts were on display, if everything that went through our mind was hearable, was detectable, was visible to others, well, first of all, we wouldn't be all that layered anymore. We'd be very exposed. If as soon as a person walked in, you didn't just see their face, but you saw their thoughts, so then you'd know a lot more about them than they may be ready to reveal to you. If as we're sitting here, we would be overhearing the thoughts of the people around us, so that would be quite uh, confronting, possibly. And for ourselves, rather uncomfortable. We're quite happy keeping many of our thoughts to ourselves. What if it wasn't that way? What, what if our thoughts were on display? What would life be like? Well, we wouldn't have any friends left, that's for sure. Um, we, we wouldn't have any respect. That, that we wouldn't be able to respect anybody else. Uh, it would be a pretty ugly scenario because Thoughts just flow. Some thoughts you control, other thoughts you don't. They pop into your head, you didn't necessarily want it, and it came there. Thoughts are not something that are totally within our hands to control. And so therefore, many of the thoughts that we have, we would rather not have. And we certainly wouldn't want the people around us to know that we had them. What we're gonna explore today in this section of Tanya is the power of thought and the definition of, of our thoughts. When I know what goes on through my mind, you don't know what's been going on through my mind in the last hour or day, but I know what's gone on through my mind. And so can I be happy? Can I really be a happy person when I know how low I stoop? When I know what passes through my mind? When, when I am aware of the thoughts that, that haunt me during the day, can I end the day and be happy with myself, be, be joyous and happy about, about who I am? We looked in chapter 26 at, a, at the person who examines their deeds, their past deeds, and recognizes their failings, that they've done wrong, and we're not perfect. In fact, we're far from it. And when you contemplate that, that can make you feel down. And we discussed last week the reaction to that and how there's a, an appropriate time to think about your past and to work on it. But that shouldn't come to you in the middle of the day. 
It shouldn't come to you when you're saying your prayers or when you're doing your work or when you're going about your business. That should be, there's a specific time of the day or the week or the year that you focus on your failings and try to fix them. But they shouldn't come to you at other times because that's just bringing you down. And when you're feeling down, you can't work on yourself. You can't be a good person. But here we're talking about something else. We're not talking about looking into your past and feeling bad about yourself. We're talking about looking at your present, your right now, and feeling bad about yourself. Because if we examine our own thoughts that nobody else knows about, no one, no one else is aware of, so we don't really measure up to be on a very high spiritual level. And here we're talking about people who may be yearning to be on a higher level, trying, striving to be a good person, a pure person, a moral person, a person that, that brings a blessing to the world. But with all of that, if I think about the things that pass through my head, the, the, the ideas, the thoughts, the fantasies, the reactions that come to my head, it's not all that pure or holy all the time. Only I know this. You don't know about me, and I don't know about you. But we can guess that each person has certain thoughts that are inappropriate, that are, that are immoral, that are ugly, that, that could, could be harmful and negative. They're only thoughts. We're just talking about thoughts at the moment. We're not talking about anything you've done. We're not talking about acting on those thoughts. We're merely talking about your internal state. And so while externally I may be behaving, doing the right thing, I may even be saying the right thing and have good control over my speech, but my thoughts are much more of a reflection of my inner reality, where I'm really holding, what, what, what my, my real spiritual level is. And there, most of us can be quite disappointed at the type of thoughts that run through our head. And so in chapters 27 and 28 of Tanya that we're going to look at this evening, we're going to look at how you can still be happy, still maintain your joy, without beating yourself up on the thoughts that you have during the course of a day. Now, if you think about it, if someone could read your mind, if somebody could look at you and read your mind, read your thoughts, what type of book would you be? What, what would the book be that, that is the, the written of your thoughts? Are you a textbook? Meaning that you, you've got a lot of technical ideas, uh, of uh, techniques, of strategies. A romance novel that you fantasize about romance all the time. A joke book just with silly things, just funny stuff, not very serious. A newspaper with all types of facts and stories and things going on. Or a mess, a mess of different thoughts of all the above and more all over the place, thoughts going all over the place. What would your book be? You don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell anyone. I can read your mind. Wow. The last one, a mess. It's, uh, it's the way known you could be one. It's a bit, a bit of all and more. You could, you could add to the list. And you could add other genres of literature that have yet even to be invented. That, that, that would be the book that would make up your thoughts. That, 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 is, that is a reality of, of our mind, that we may be focusing on a certain task at a certain time where, when we're at work or we're studying and, and we're, we're in a very prescribed type of environment. And even there, our mind tends to wander. It's at certain moments, you, you, your mind does wander off from, from the subject. You daydream a little bit. What do we daydream about? What, what occupies our mind? Some of the thoughts are harmless thoughts, just just dreaming of where you'd rather be rather than at your desk or where, where you are currently. Some of the thoughts are not so savory, let's, let's say. You wouldn't want other people to overhear those thoughts, thinking about other people uh, in, in inappropriate ways or in, in negative ways. Your, your opinions of this person and that person. Uh, when we're in a, a state where we're upset or angry or feeling hurt because of something that somebody's done, our thoughts may turn even violent. I'm not a violent person, I've never, never hurt anybody. But my thoughts, in my, in my mind, in my thoughts, every now and then, does a thought come up that is, that is negative and violent? Yeah, could be, why not? It's just a thought, I wouldn't act on it. The thoughts pop up all the time. And so, whatever type of person we are, and whatever occupies our mind, most of the time, we could say most people's mind is quite a mess of thoughts in, in the course of a, of a whole day even if you would just analyze your thoughts for an hour, which would be a fascinating project to try. Just analyze your thoughts for, for an hour and think of the train of where, where your mind takes you 
it's all over the place. And sometimes you can go you know, backwards and work out how you got to this thought. One thought leads to another. But our, our mind works all the time and is constantly functioning. If somebody else could read it, it would probably be quite a messy tanglement of, of different thoughts and ideas. Thank God people cannot read our minds. Our minds are kept to ourselves and therefore we're able to hide a lot of the ugliness we have. However, if we're talking here about the, the attempt, the striving to be a, a, a more elevated, refined person, so then our thoughts count. They, they mean something. And, and it bothers a person who is striving for holiness that our thoughts can still be quite ugly, that we can, that we can still have some quite dark thoughts or inappropriate thoughts. They pop into our mind, and we have to deal with that. So that's what chapter 27 begins with, the, the dealing with these negative thoughts, thoughts that we have. So should sadness, however, not come from worry over sins, as we discussed in the last chapter, says Rabbi Schneer Zalman, but from evil thoughts and desires that enter your mind. If, if the reason why you're feeling down about yourself is not because of something you've done in the past, but it's because of your current state, your level, that where you're at spiritually, that you feel is is so lowly as proven by the thoughts that are popping into your head. If this is what's disappointing you, which in a way, let's, let's just say, is a wonderful thing. It's great if it bothers you that your thoughts are, are, are not on, on the standard they should be. That's already a great thing that it bothers you. But he was saying that it's making you sad. It's, it's, it's making you upset at yourself, feeling low about yourself because of these thoughts that come to you. Here you are thinking that you'd made some progress in your inner spiritual life. You thought you were a rather refined person and the most unrefined, ugly thought pops into your head. And uh, that makes you upset. You haven't done anything, but you're thinking stuff. If that's what's bothering you, if that's what's making you sad, so then what should your reaction be? So this is the analysis of Rabbi Schneerzalm. If they enter not during prayer, but whilst you're occupied with mundane business. So not during the, your, your spiritual time of the day, but during your just work, study, normal mundane activities. You should on the contrary be happy in that though they enter your mind, you avert your mind from them in order to fulfill the injunction that says in the Torah, do not follow after your heart and after your own eyes, which lead you astray. The verse does not speak of the righteous, to refer to them as going astray, God forbid, but of intermediates, benonim like you. Meaning, Rabbi Shnei Zalman here is saying that if during the course of your day, when you're just sitting at work or doing your, your stuff, and these ugly thoughts come to your mind, a violent thought, an inappropriate sexual thought, a, a, a thought about another person that's degrading, that these thoughts you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be entertaining, you shouldn't be, be having in, in your mind. So this should not lead you to sadness. In fact, it's a reason to be happy. Why should you be happy about having those thoughts? Because you are now in a situation where you can do a mitzvah. You can fulfill a commandment of the Torah. Because the Torah says, it's actually in the Shema Yisrael prayer, that do not follow after your own heart and your own eyes which lead you astray. Meaning that when you are being led astray by your own heart and your own eyes, meaning that you've had a thought, a fantasy that is inappropriate, or a, an urge that is not moral, or some type of drive within you that you've seen something and as a result you desire something that is forbidden to you, or as a result of something that you've viewed you want to do something, you want to hurt somebody, you want to do something that is in, in, inappropriate, wrong, immoral. When you have that urge, you are now in a circumstance where you can fulfill the commandment to not follow after your heart and your eyes that are leading you astray. And that is a reason for joy. You are now in a situation where you can elevate yourself, you can do a mitzvah, you can do a good deed. So just like any time you're in a position where to do a mitzvah, to do a good deed, that should be a reason for joy. You can actually do something positive in the world. This is a case where the only time you're able to fulfill this commandment is when you had an inappropriate thought to not follow. So this is a lovely opportunity you've just been given. That's, that's how you should view it. Instead of viewing it as 
look how disgusting I am that I've had such a thought. You should say, look at what a beautiful opportunity I have to push away this thought. Because if you don't have it, you can't push it away. If you, if you never experience it, so then you're not in, in, in able to battle with it. Only if you have it, you can fight it. And if the Torah itself has a commandment that says, don't follow after your heart and your eyes that are leading you astray. If the Torah says that, what does that mean? It means that God sort of like expects that this is going to happen, that this is, this is within the realm of normal expected experience, that it is a part of the human condition, that we do have urges that are inappropriate, that we do have thoughts that we shouldn't have, but we have them. That part is normal. The question is, what is your reaction to it? What do you do about it? Do you feel down about yourself that you had the thought? Do you beat yourself up as being uh, some, some low life because it came to you? Well, if you do that, you're falling for the trap of the animal soul. Because remember we saw in la last week's chapter, the animal soul wants you to feel down. If you're feeling down about yourself, then the animal soul can walk all over you. Your negative side will, will conquer you very easily when you're feeling down about yourself, because you're sluggish. When you're sluggish and, and slow, you're an easy target. And so what seems like a very righteous emotion, feeling disappointed in how lowly you are because of these thoughts that you had, it sounds very righteous. That's actually not righteous at all. That is your evil inclination. It's the animal soul. It's your negative side trying to pull you down, dressing itself up in righteous clothing, in, in very, very sanctimonious, self-righteous thoughts. Look how, look how low I am. Look, look, how, look how degraded I am. That is actually your, your animal side, your animal soul, your evil soul trying to draw you down, to make you feel down. Because once you feel down, then you're not going to do any good. The appropriate reaction is to say, okay, observe the thought. Observe the fact that I've just had a negative thought. I, I recognize that's what it is, it, it, and, and I observe it. I'm responsible for it. It's my thought. And I'm now in a circumstance to do a mitzvah, the mitzvah of rejecting that thought of not allowing that thought to take root. As we discussed in earlier chapters, and Rabbi Shnei Zalman uh, will, will continue the idea, that there are thoughts that we can control, and there are thoughts that we cannot control. There are thoughts that pop into our head, that are as a result of our personality, just, just who we are. And there are thoughts that didn't pop into our head, that we kept them in our head. We entertain those thoughts. A thought popping into your head is what we're talking about here. A negative thought popped into your head. You didn't look for it, it came to you. That's fine, that's normal. That means you're not a tzaddik. A tzaddik is a perfectly righteous person who has cleansed their personality of any negativity, of any lowliness, of any selfishness, and so therefore negative thoughts don't come to them. It doesn't even pop into their heads. If you're not on that level, which is all of us, so then you have negativity still in your soul, it's going to pop up in your thoughts every now and then. That you have no control over. That's just your reality. Your opportunity now is to negate that thought, to push it away, to say, that's not nice, and therefore I'm not going to entertain that thought. I'm not going to keep it in my mind. And that opportunity is only given to we non sadikim we who are not righteous, we who are not pure. Only we can keep this commandment. If you are a pure being that has no evil thoughts, so then what does it mean to you? Do not follow after your own heart and your own eyes which lead you astray. They don't lead me astray if I'm a tzaddik. If I'm completely purified in internally, my thoughts, my heart, my, my eyes don't lead me astray. They lead me to goodness because I've only got goodness inside of me. Well, I'm very lucky. I'm very fortunate to not be a tzaddik, to not be such a holy person. Why am I lucky? I've, I can fulfill this commandment. I do have ugly thoughts that I'm able to push away, that I'm able to negate. So says Rabbi Shnei Zalman, who do you think this verse is talking about when it says don't, don't follow your, your heart and your mind and your, and your eyes? You think it's talking about a tzaddik? Of course not. It's talking about you. You who are what's called a benini. As we met in the earlier chapters of Tanya, a benini, an intermediate literally, means the person who is refusing to be wicked, but not able to be a pure saint either that we're, we don't let ourselves do the wrong thing, we can control ourselves, but we're not perfect. We, we still have urges, temptations to do the wrong thing. That is where we all fall. That's, that's the category that we all fall under. A wicked person is somebody who's under control of their animal self. They just act selfishly and immorally always. A tzaddik, a righteous person, is somebody who has total control. They've conquered their negative side. They have no negative urges 
Not only they don't do the wrong thing, they don't even have an urge to do the wrong thing, ever. That is not us. We are the person who has urges, negative ones, but we can control them. That is the Bainini, and that's who, that's who we are. And that's who this verse is talking to. So therefore, you've been given an amazing opportunity to fulfill a commandment of God, to do a mitzvah. So just like we're in, in other circumstances where you have an opportunity to do a mitzvah, you, you should be happy that you have that opportunity. If you're in a position to help another person, so we feel bad for the other person needing the help, but we should feel joy in the fact that we're able to help, that we're able to, to be in a position of doing a mitzvah, of doing good. If you're able to do a mitzvah, that should be a, a source of joy. If, if you're, if you're uh, put into a situation where, where you have the opportunity to fulfill the divine will, to, to, to do a good deed in the world, that is a source of joy. Here's an internal opportunity to do a mitzvah. So, so already this, if, if we train ourselves to react that way to a negative thought, then it won't bring us down. On the contrary, it'll be a source of joy. It'll be an uplifting opportunity to do a mitzvah. That's, that's the first point here in the, in the chapter. Rabbi Shnei Zalman adds another analysis here. The cause of your sadness about these distracting thoughts, why are you sad in the first place? Why does it upset you, disappoint you, that you had this negative thought? Why would somebody feel a sadness because they're thinking these things? What's the cause of it? So what is it? Why would somebody feel sad about thought? They didn't sin. They didn't do anything wrong. They just had a bad thought. Why are you feeling sad? What's the cause of it? Yeah? Starting a bit about from arrogance, I think. Why? Well, because they believe that they should be like the tzaddik. They should be the kind of person that doesn't entertain such thoughts. And therefore, they would be disappointed in their normality. Correct. Correct. What is, what is the cause of sadness? It is, it is arrogance. Arrogance is the cause of sadness here. Why, why arrogance? Again, we, we thought, I mean, the, the, the first reaction to somebody feeling sad about their negative thoughts is that that's coming from a very holy place, from, from a very, very uh, high expectation of oneself. But that itself is coming from an arrogance. Why, why is it arrogant? Explains Rabbi Shnei Zalman, in that you do not know your place. You are sad because you're not a tzaddik. As righteous as, as, a, as right, the righteous are certainly not plagued by such foolish thoughts. But had you recognized your true level, which is very far from the level of a tzaddik, if only you could be a benoni and not wicked, then surely this is the mission of the intermediates, to control the evil thoughts rising from the heart to the brain and to completely avert the mind from them, thrusting the temptation away with both hands. Meaning that the source of sadness, the reason why a person could be disappointed, upset about themselves because of the th bad thoughts they're having, is because they have misdiagnosed their own level, their own spiritual level. They don't know their place. If you don't know your place, so then you have expectations of yourself that are unrealistic. And so if you think, I want to be a tzaddik, I want to be a pure, holy person. I want to be somebody who has graduated, is beyond the battle already, not struggling with evil, but made it to the end already, that, that I, I, I'm past, I'm past it all. If that's what you expect of yourself and you, and you think of yourself, then you are setting yourself up for a major disappointment because you're nowhere near there. Remember, in earlier chapters of Tanya, one of the most liberating teachings of Tanya is that the tzaddik is not something that w most of us will ever reach. The tzaddik who has purified their personality entirely is simply not our goal. Our goal is to be a benini, which means somebody who controls their behavior, does the right thing, but your personality, your inner world, you can shift it, you can move it, you can elevate it, you can improve it, but to perfect it, forget about it. Perfection is out of our hands, out of our reach. It's not something for us. Which, as we discussed, at first sounds a bit disappointing, but in fact, no, it's, it's very liberating. And this chapter will explain why. As long as you think that you're supposed to be a tzaddik, you're supposed to be perfect, then you're definitely going to be disappointed. And this applies even to somebody who has, let's say, been quite a benini for quite a while. 
A bainini, remember, means somebody who doesn't do the wrong thing, who does not do anything immoral. Never. That means they don't ever tell a lie. Ever. Except when you're supposed to tell a lie. Right? In, there, there are times when a lie is moral. It's the right thing to do. When telling the truth, all it will do is hurt another person, so then you don't have to be truthful. When, when somebody asks you, so how do I look today? S somebody close to you. So you don't have to be brutally honest. You can say it in a, in a you can couch it in, in a way that, uh, that is sensitive. And, and many other examples of where you don't have to absolutely tell the truth, but this is only where it's for the other person, for, the, for, for their sake. For the sake of keeping peace, you don't have to tell the full truth. But in all other circumstances, you have to tell the truth. So when you call somebody back and say, sorry, I lost your number. Yeah? Do, do, do people lose numbers still today? Like, does that, does that really happen? Is that really why you didn't call them back? Well, sorry, my, my, yeah, my phone, I've been having phone problems. I mean, it's not a lie. I mean, everyone has phone problems, you know. Your phone calls just drop out, you know. It happens to everybody. Is that why you didn't call back? These things are lies to cover ourselves. They're, they're meaningless. It's nothing. A Benini never does that. A Benini tells the truth. Does not even slightly alter the truth in order to cover themselves. A Benini never speaks bad about another person. Ne never, never gossips. Never says anything negative. They never do any wrong action. Doesn't mean they don't have wrong urges. They may have an urge to say the wrong thing, or to do the wrong thing, or to tell a lie, but they never do it. They control themselves every single time. That's a benini. If you've been doing that for a while, if you've gone for a week with only saying pure honesty, only 100% only truth, and not saying a negative word about another person, you could start to think that you're a bit of a tzaddik. You could start to feel quite self-righteous and the, on a high level. And if you do it for a bit longer than that, so then you're convinced that you've made it. And then an ugly desire will come to you, that a, a serious temptation to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, and you're going to be suddenly very surprised at yourself that you're not a tzaddik. That's because you misdiagnosed yourself. You are not a tzaddik and never will be. That's not what you're supposed to be. Your mission is to be a bainani, to do the right thing, even though you're not always going to feel like it. So too, somebody who's on a spiritual path, somebody who's, who has determined they're going to pray every single morning, they're going to get up and say, say the prayers every single morning. So they do it, they stick with it, they, they keep the resolution, and every morning they say the prayers, and it, it's going really well. And again, after a while, they think, I, I've actually really reached a higher level, a higher spiritual level. I've elevated myself to a higher place. My soul is shining, and that they feel good. But if they fool themselves to think that, you've, that they're a tzaddik, they're going to be surprised when suddenly one morning they have this urge not to pray. They're just not in the mood whatsoever. They don't want to do it at all. And they say, well, obviously it was all a, a, a facade. Like the, all this praying that I've done for however long obviously didn't do anything because I'm not, I'm not in the mood of it. I, I don't want this. So it's not really me. That's because you thought you were a tzaddik who wants to do the right thing, who wants to pray every day. A tzaddik wants to pray every day. A bainani doesn't. A bainani goes through times when they're not interested at all in anything spiritual. That's normal. The, the wanting is normal. The doing is what a bainani controls. I do the right thing when I'm not in the mood. I hold myself back from saying the wrong thing even when I'm tempted to say it. That's what a bainani is. Somebody whose internal world is a massive struggle an inner battle constantly, but they're a behavior they control to do the right thing. If you think you're a tzaddik, then you're cruising for a bruising. You're waiting for a major disappointment. It is going to fall apart. You're going to get in, in trouble. And so that's why somebody gets sad about their negative thoughts, because you thought you were a tzaddik, but you're not. So accept them. Again, this is just your animal soul. This is a very crafty scheme of your evil inclination. Make you think you're a tzaddik, so when you see you're not a tzaddik, you'll be so disappointed that you'll just throw in the towel and forget about it. Why should I bother with all this spirituality in the first place? I got nowhere. I've been praying for six months, and I haven't changed. I've, I've been doing, trying to hold my tongue back from saying anything evil, and I still have this desire to, to gossip or lie or whatever it is. And so 
that feeling of disappointment is just to cause you to give up on the whole thing. It's a, all a scheme of the evil inclination. That's the animal soul. The bainani, the intermediate, the job of the bainani is thoughts come to you, including negative thoughts. Temptations come, and your job is to control them. But they're still going to come, and they're going to come back again and again and again. And your job is to push them away with both hands, meaning completely, totally push them away. Not, not just delay it, not just uh, compromise with it, completely negate it entirely. That's the job of the Benini. So the sad thoughts come from, as a result of a missed self-diagnosis. So therefore, you should not feel depressed, nor should your heart become exceedingly troubled, even though you're engaged all your days in this battle. For perhaps this is what you were born to do, and this is your mission, to constantly subjugate the powers of evil. These lines I've put into bold because I believe they're, they're one of the headlines of the Book of Tanya. That coming to accept that this is your life mission. It's going to be till the day you die, you're going to have this battle. You're going to have urges that are negative, that are ugly, and they're going to come to you and you're going to have to fight them. And even if you are victorious, they're still going to come to you. They're going to come back and you still have to fight them. And it's never going to go away. It's never going to stop. It's a never-ending battle. And this is what you were born to do. This is your mission. This is exactly what you're here to do, to subjugate the powers of evil. Subjugate the powers of evil means to hold them down, to control them, to keep them at bay, but never actually conquer them, never get rid of them. The powers of evil, which are not external powers, they're internal. There's, it's a voice in you. It's going to be there for the rest of your life. There are going to, is, there's going to be this voice inside you that's trying to pull you down. And it's always there and it's waiting for its opportunity to strike. It's not going to go away. All you can do is subjugate it, control it. But you're never going to really get rid of it. You'll move ahead, you'll, you'll, you'll grow, you'll get better. Your battles will become maybe on a more refined, higher level, but it's always going to be a battle. And until you embrace this, until you accept this, so then you're not going to be successful in this battle at all. Because until you get what the, the definition of the battle is, until you understand the rules of the game, you're not going to be playing it correctly. If you think the rules are, I'm trying to become perfect, and if I haven't, so then I've failed, so then this is going to be a very short game, and you're going to lose, you lose the fight. If you accept that this is a lifelong battle, and I've got to be in it on a daily basis, and this is my mission, so then, then you're in with in, you're in the with the running. You're in the running. You're you're in with a chance. So, I want to just spend a few minutes going deeper into this idea because this is a central idea of of the thinking of Tanya, and uh, and it's it's ex explained in other Kabbalistic sources, but the way Tanya puts it, it. Uh, it crystallizes, it makes it very practical. There's a, there's a term that's used in, first used in the Zohar, Kabbalistic work, called iskafia, which means subjugation, like we just saw, which is always contrasted with ishapcha, another Hebrew to, uh, Aramaic term meaning transformation. Iskafia, subjugation, means I could do it, but I won't. I'm tempted to do the wrong thing, but I subjugate my negative urges. I hold myself back, I control myself to not do it, and I stay on the, on, on the path of goodness, not because I naturally gravitate to it, but because I'm holding myself back. I'm stopping myself from doing the wrong thing. Ishapcha is transformation, where you've transformed your negative side, the part of your heart that, that has negative drive, that has negative urges, you've turned it around, you've converted it, you've absolutely transformed it into goodness. That's called ishapcha in Aramaic, in, in, which is a Kabbalistic term, a tra transformation. The first one, iskafia, is the mission of the Benini. The Benini's job is to subjugate, to fight, to control evil. The tzaddik is able to transform evil, ishapcha, where evil itself is turned around. The negative side of their heart has actually become positive. That is out of our reach to a large extent. Our mission is iskafia, 
is self-control. Rabbi Shnei Zalman gives a few examples of this, of self-control. Self-control is something that we need to exercise. Like any muscle in our body needs to be utilized and exercised in order to function. And the more we exercise it, the more we stretch it, and the more we can use it. So too in our spiritual makeup, the spiritual muscle of iskafia is something that needs to be exercised and practiced. Every time you do it, you get better at it, and therefore you're able to extend the realm of iskafia of self-control. So on the most basic level, self-control means not doing that which is immoral and evil. That it, it's quite normal to want to do certain things, but you're not allowed to do them, so you don't do them. So for example, on a very basic level, stealing is the most logical thing to do. If I'm walking down the street and I see something that I like, so I should take it. Ask any little kid, and that's what they do. They see something they like and they take it. It doesn't cross their mind that there's anything wrong with that because on a very basic level, on a very basic instinctive level, the human being's morality is what's good for me, what I like. I like this, so I'm taking it. Why shouldn't I? The argument that it belongs to somebody else, that's esoteric. That, that's, that's abstract. That's, that's mysticism. To, to say that I can't have it because it belongs to somebody else, what are you talking about? To, to, to a child, it's mine. I've got it. And I want it, so I take it. That is, that is completely normal human behavior. Moral behavior is that we can't do everything we want. Not everything that you see as good for you is actually good. Goodness is not defined by your desires. So therefore you see something you want, but you can't have it because it's not yours. And so as a child, we were taught over and over again after taking things that belong to other people, no, you can't do that. And eventually it becomes a, a part of, of our, our moral lexicon in our mind that there's what's mine and there's what's, what belongs to somebody else. I cannot take what belongs to somebody else. That, that is wrong. I have to control myself. As we get older, we may have learned to control ourselves so we don't just take anything we see. Doesn't mean we don't want to. It doesn't mean we don't want what somebody else has. It's just that we've controlled ourselves to not just grab what anyone else has. We, we, we've learned to control ourselves. That's a very basic level of escafia that we learn from a very early age, that, that you can't take what doesn't, doesn't belong to you. It doesn't mean that you've done ishapcha, you've transformed yourself to not want what belongs to somebody else. You may not have reached there, but to not do something about it, to not actually take it, that level we've reached. And then it goes further to go through all the, all the rules of morality and appropriateness and what we're supposed to do and not supposed to do. We have urges to do anything and everything, but you're not supposed to do that. You can't do that. It's not appropriate, so you hold yourself back and you control yourself. Rabbi Shnei Zalman says, it's not enough to just have self-control to not do that which is evil. You have to actually expand that. You have to have self-control to not just do everything you want. You have to learn that not everything you want has to be yours. Even if you're allowed it, even if it's okay, you don't have to feed your desires immediately. He says that there were, there were, there were certain people who they had a custom of delaying breakfast that what they would do is, th these were scholars who would spend the entire day studying and meditating, but what they did is they would make their breakfast later than everyone else. Everyone would have breakfast at nine o'clock and they would have theirs at 11 o'clock. Why? They ate the same breakfast and they spent the same amount of time in the day doing their studies and their meditations, but they delayed their gratification. We're talking about an innocent, nice breakfast, not hurting anybody, not stealing their breakfast, just eating their normal breakfast. But they delayed it in order to be in control of themselves. They're not eating breakfast just because everyone's eating breakfast. They can hold it, hold it and delay it. And so, not, not, that the, not, not Rabbi Shnei Zalman doesn't necessarily recommend that we all do that, but, but you can do it on a, on a minor scale. When you see a food that you want to eat, it may even be healthy. We're not talking about unhealthy food, not harmful. But I don't have to eat it right now. If I say, I would like to eat that, I observe that desire, and I say, okay, and I'm go I'll eat it in a few minutes. I don't have to have it right now. Practicing doing that will make you a better person. Not because eating that food is a bad thing, but because being a person in, self, in, in, in control of oneself is a good thing. If you can control yourself there, 
then you can control yourself on bigger things. If you've trained that muscle of self-control, so then you'll be able to utilize it when it's really necessary. Not everything you want has to be consumed immediately. This is completely counter to everything that the world today tells us, that everything you want, you must have it right now. That if a, if a download takes five seconds, it's ridiculous. What's wrong? There's, there's, there's something, something broken here. If, if we order something and, and three days later it hasn't been delivered, it's like, what's going on? We're, we're already asking, you know, tracking our, our packages to see where they are because it's been three days and they haven't been delivered. We, we have this very instantaneous type of, type of grat gratification where we expect everything right now. That's a problem, even though we're doing nothing wrong. We're not stealing anything. But when we feel that we have to have what we want immediately, then that is setting us up for a, an immoral type of life because certain urges will not be positive, will not be good, will not be moral, but I need it now. And it'll be very hard to control them because we're not controlling our urges generally. Uh, the, the examples in the pictures, uh, eating is one of them. H having an urge to eat something, controlling yourself and not eating it immediately. To, even if you're going to eat it, but eat it a bit later, to, to hold it back, to control yourself from eating, that is, that is a big one. Saying things as well, talking. Sometimes we want to say something, but maybe it doesn't have to be said right now. Now, of course, if we're talking about something negative, so, something wrong, such as telling a lie we spoke about earlier, or, or gossiping, these type of things, so we have to control ourselves to not say it all. To not, say, not, to not speak negatively about another person. But sometimes even to, to make a joke, to, 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 make, to make light of a situation where it's not bad, it's not wrong, but it's taking the seriousness out of a situation that should be serious. Or it's deflecting pressure off yourself in a way that's not so healthy. It, it's, or it's changing the subject where it shouldn't be changing the subject. To think before we say something, before we make a comment, and to be able to not say it, that can sometimes be an excruciating thing. That's hard, but that's self-control. I didn't have to say it, so I'm not going to say it. Uh, even more relevant, I think, today is, is our exposure to, to technology and our use of technology. Where here, everything is very instantaneous, and not necessarily do we have to do it right now. This picture is there's a, there's a, a program called Self Control. It's an app that you, can, that you can put on. I haven't looked into it. I don't know if it's good or not. But, but the idea, and, and more and more people are, are recognizing this, is that we need self-control in our use of technology. It is, it is controlling us, and there's no question about it. We, we, we're all aware of this. And so having self-control here, it's like blacklisting certain websites that, that are fine, that are normal. But do I need to utilize that now? Do I need it all the time? Because everything's on one device now, so I just went to check my messages. In the meantime, I also had to check a thousand other things, and I forgot what I actually went to my phone to do, because it's all in one place, because I'm not in control. It's controlling me. The, these, these messages that pop up into our head that just take us in a direction that we didn't plan whatsoever. We are being controlled by it. It's not controlling us. I even saw somebody who said that they felt they were such an addict to their Facebook that they made for themselves a 40-letter password, <laughs> 40 characters, and they sign out every time they look at Facebook, they sign out afterwards, they have to sign back in. And I thought, this is fascinating. What, what this person was doing is using their laziness to overcome their addiction. It's, 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 it's brilliant. They're taking two, two negative traits and pitting them against each other. Because so, who can be bothered typing in such a long password? So that is stopping them from the, the distraction, of the, the lack of control of going onto their Facebook. That's clever. That is really clever. That's turning the animal soul against itself. Uh, and, 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 and that is brilliant. We, ne we need to be able to, to control ourselves. So here again, I'm not even talking here about doing inappropriate things on our phones or, or on, on the internet. That goes without saying that that, that that we need to control, and that's not easy either. But I'm talking about even doing the normal good things, the things that are, that are mundane, that are, that are OK. Just, just checking our messages. How many times do we have to check our messages? Do, do we have to do that right now? 
do we, do we have to interrupt the conversation we're having with a real human being in front of us to, to answer every beep and buzz that, that we feel? That, that self-control, that level of self-control is also important. And so, you know, sleeping with the phone on next to you, uh, does it need to be in, in your bedroom when you sleep in the first place? Uh, does it have to be on all the time? There, there, are, there are these things that would seem like simple, but they, these are big moral issues of the day. This is what self-control is. And so we actually have more opportunities than ever to, to do iskafia, to do self-control, by putting our phone on silent or shutting it off completely or just ignoring it for a few hours a day. For some people, that seems unimaginable. But that's, that's the job of the Benini, to exercise the muscle of self-control, and that's your whole life. That's what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. And if you can do it in those areas, those areas where it, you're not doing something forbidden, but you're controlling yourself, so then you're creating a buffer zone that when the ugly urges come to do the wrong thing, you have the power to, to, to say no. When we, when we are online, so sometimes inappropriate stuff comes to us. We, we, we didn't go to it. We, we weren't looking for it. It comes to us. That, that, that can happen. If you are a person who cannot control what you look at, if every pop-up attracts you and you, you get into it, so then when the pop-up is inappropriate, you're not going to be able to hold back. And so that will lead you on a, on a terrible path that can could, that could destroy lives, yours and, and those around you. But a person who controls when they use their phone and when they don't, a person who does not have to respond to, to every, every beep that, that comes through, is a person who, when the occasion comes that something inappropriate pops up, they're in control and they're a step removed from that. They're able to stay away from it. This is what Escafia is, and this is a lifetime mission. It's going to go on for the rest of our lives. We're never going to graduate from it. It's a battle that is every single day. So. So the Benini is the person who embraces that battle, who knows that it's a lifetime thing, who knows that that is their mission, and therefore is not going to be disappointed that those negative urges come. They just know that this is my opportunity to beat them, to overcome them. Any questions so far? Yep. Just with the, um, the second point, and maybe we'll get on to that soon, but it is Hapsha. So that one is transformation, and that's the job of the study. Yeah. Um, but, so, that means it can't be internal transformation because it wouldn't be a tzaddik yet. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have anything to transform. So he has to only transform external stuff, is that correct? No, uh, the, the, tzaddik, the, tzaddik, the tzaddik is the person who has transformed their inner self. They've, they've reached the level of transformation, so any negative urge is transformed into, into holiness, into positivity. But how do they transform something when they weren't at Sadiq and don't have the power to transform because they're not at Sadiq? Like before, if they were at 80%, how well, do they get Sadiq, the extra 20%? Rabbi Shnezam says that Sadiq is somebody who's born with the power to be at Sadiq. They just okay. have to reveal that. Okay, so Although he does, say, he does say in this chapter as well um, that there's another thing. A Sadiq could have a negative thought. A negative thought may pop into the mind of a Sadiq, but it's not his thought. It's somebody else's. Because a Sadiq is on a level where they're not only purifying themselves, but they're elevating those around them as well. And so a tzaddik may have a negative thought that pops into their mind that belongs to somebody else, and they're able to transform it, to turn that around to be holy, because they have the power of transformation. The rest of us, when we have a negative thought, have to push it away. And are they able to perform that one mitzvah, the one where they can invert their eyes? Because No. It no. doesn't apply to them. There are, not every mitzvah applies to every person. But there's a mitzvah that says if you steal something, you have to return it. If you don't steal anything, you don't have that mitzvah, right? So here as well, if you don't have negative urges, you don't have the mitzvah to reject them. You miss out on that mitzvah. Yep. Are there any known tzaddiks today as there were in previous centuries? Are there any noted tzaddik? Look, there are, there are definitely holy people around, all, you know, around the world. Uh, it says that every generation there are, there are holy people. The problem with a tzaddik is they don't identify themselves as a tzaddik. They don't introduce themselves as, as a tzaddik. If somebody does, they're probably not. Um, but definitely there are, there are holy people who... Uh, I, I don't know if there's any in the eastern suburbs, you know, but, uh, but there might be. There might be. Yeah? With self-control, so every 
everybody is going to have the negative thoughts, but then your mission is to is to subjugate them, yes. and push them down. Mm -hmm. Is it easier for some people's personalities than others to do that? Some is people are more naturally inclined to delay gratification than others. Okay. Well, I think I think look, each one of us is is built in a certain way. Some, some people have a stronger escafia muscle than others, um, but others have trained more than others and so are able to do it more. Each person is given the, the animal soul that is commensurate to their divine soul, which means the stronger your urges, the stronger power you have to overcome those urges. And, and somebody who has weaker urges has a weaker capacity. So you might see one person who seems to be very in control and that's because their, maybe their negative side is not all that strong. And that's because they don't have such a strong soul to combat it, they're given their challenge. Whereas another person who seems to really struggle is because they have a lot of power. And so that, that's, that's what they can do. So again, if, if, if we feel ourselves as being somebody who has a lot of temptations, that's not a reason to feel bad about ourselves. On the contrary, that means that you have amazing energy and power to overcome that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be given that challenge. Um, in, in the endeavor to develop self-control, and the example you gave of delaying breakfast, um, why, wh I don't understand why that's not the same thing as equated to an egoic uh, endeavor. Like it's, although it's developing a muscle, it's still coming from a place of arrogance to be able to say, well, I'm going to not eat breakfast now. Why is that, why is that arrogance? Uh, well, because you perceive that you can... Um, I, think it's, I think that the base of it seems to come from a really um, egoic, egoic sort of centre. Well, no, what, what you're saying about arrogance is that if you think that you're a tzaddik and you should be above temptation, that is coming from an arrogance of thinking, thinking higher of yourself than you really are. That's not who you are. That's not what you're, what you're about. Here it's talking about self-control. It's not talking about telling people that I laid my breakfast. It's not, it's not, it's not something that you advertise. It's that, that you, you don't, just because I want it doesn't mean I'm going to give it to myself. I'm going I'm to hold myself back. This, uh, this, this doesn't mean self-flagellation doesn't mean harming yourself, hurting yourself, torturing yourself. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking just about my urge does not have to be fed now. I can delay it. Um, and that's, something that's realistic. That's something we can all do. That's not, that's not you know, uh, going higher than your ability. That's, that's within our ability to do. But you have to gauge it. If, if somebody says, well, it says in Tanya that they would eat breakfast two hours late, so I'm going to do that. Is that what your level is? Is that, is that what you're about? Is that what you're supposed to be doing? Not necessarily. Maybe, maybe two minutes. I'm, I want to eat now, so I'm going to eat in two minutes. Maybe that you can do. It, you, know, you, have to, you have to gauge what's, what's your appropriate challenge. Um, but ego is like, I'm doing what I want. I'm, I'm the center of the universe, and so therefore if I want it, I have to feed that. But choosing then to not eat would be the same thing. Why, well, why are you not eating? If you're doing it to feel self-righteous, that's, that's, that's ego. If you're doing it to control your, your urge, that's not ego, that's negating self. That's going against your urge. How does this relate with that to happiness? I mean, where is the that, um, th Because the reason why we're not happy, we, we beat up on ourselves because of our thoughts, is because we we overestimated ourselves. As soon as you accept that you're here to struggle, so then you can be joyous in the struggle rather than being disappointed that you're struggling. Saying, why haven't I got anywhere? Why, why aren't I a saint? That, that's, that's the point. That's where, that's where happiness comes in. That's where we battle the, the sadness. Let's move to the next idea. What if you experience lustful imaginations or other distracting thoughts while praying or studying Torah? Until now, we're talking about where these thoughts came to you in the midst of your mundane activities. And we said the job is to look at that, to observe it, I'm having that thought, and to then fight it, push it away. What about if it happens in the midst of prayer or studying Torah? Says Rabbi Shnei Zalman, do not let your heart dwell on them, but immediately avert your mind from them. This is slightly different. The first case was where you're going about your business 
and then these negative thoughts come to you, a negative, a, 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 an inappropriate thought. So what are you supposed to do? You've got a mitzvah to do now. You've got a mitzvah to not go after that thought, to fight it, to push it away with two hands, as, as he said. M completely reject that thought. In prayer, it's a little bit different. In prayer, you're not supposed to observe the thought and then fight it, push it away. In prayer, avert your mind from it. Change the subject. Because at this time, now is not the time to be fighting with that thought. Now is the time to be putting your thoughts back onto the spiritual pursuit that you're involved in. This is a fascinating idea that the thoughts that come to us during prayer need a different reaction to the thoughts that come to us in our daily activities. Why? Do not be downcast, he says, but do not be downcast at heart and feel dejected and low, especially during prayer, which should be with great joy. On the contrary, draw fresh strength and intensify your effort with all your power to concentrate on the prayer with increased joy and gladness in the realization that the foreign thought that had invaded your heart comes from the animal soul, which in the case of the Bani wages war with the divine soul within. Meaning that one of the hallmarks of prayer is distracting thoughts. It's, it's almost as if that your, the way to pray is to try to pray and the thoughts come to you. Anyone who's, who's attempted Jewish prayer will know that it is a very, very difficult pursuit. It's an extremely difficult thing to do. One of the most inaccessible things of all Jewish practice is prayer. Because we open the Siddur, open the prayer book, and whether you read it in the Hebrew and understand it, or you read it and don't understand it, or you read the English that you do understand, it's, it's thick, it's opaque, it's hard to get into. And almost immediately in opening the book, the distracting thoughts come to our head. Meaning, every single possible thing that we need to do will come to us at, at that time. Everything that, that, that every activity that, that, we're, that we're involved in, every unfinished business from work, every conversation that we have, everything that is going on in our life will pop into our mind during prayer. In fact, this is a technique. If you've forgotten something, if you're, if you're not sure what you're supposed to be doing, or you can't remember somebody's name, or you start davening. Open a, open a siddur and start praying. You'll remember it. Whatever it is will come back to you then. Because everything comes to you except for the prayer. And, and so this, this, is, this is almost ex expected as par for the course, that as soon as you start trying to pray, thoughts are going to pop into your head. Says Rabbi Shneur Zalman, don't engage in these thoughts. Don't start battling them. Don't get upset and feel dejected and low that ugh, I can't pray, because then you've ruined it. As soon as you feel frustrated, you can't pray, because prayer has to be done with joy. All, all, all spirituality, all connection and divine communication has to be with joy, has to be, has to be uh, on an on a enthusiastic level. It can't be with, with uh, despondency. So you should be inspired by the negative thought. It should intensify your effort to, to pray even more. And you should actually pray with more joy now because of the distracting thought that came to you. Why? Because you should realize that that foreign thought, where did that come from? It came from my animal soul. Prayer is a beautiful time to experience the two sides of your personality. You have a divine soul and you have an animal soul. The divine soul is the one that's trying to pray. The animal soul is trying to interrupt that prayer by sending you every distracting thought possible. If anyone had any doubt about the thesis of Tanya, that we have two souls, a divine holy soul and an animalistic in, uh, instinctive soul, and they're at loggerheads battling each other, constantly wrestling with each other. If anyone had any doubt about that thesis, all they need to do is try praying. And then they will see the two souls come out very, very clearly. One side of you trying to connect and do something lofty, and the other side of you trying to do anything it can to pull you away from it, to distract you, and to take you out of the prayer. And so this should actually give you a bit of enthusiasm. It should be, it's a bit exciting. It's a bit exhilarating to experience the head-on collision of the, of the animal soul with the divine soul. That, look, look, this is amazing. It's almost like on cue. I open the siddur and the animal soul woke up and is throwing stuff at me. What does that mean? What, what does it mean? Why should that make you excited? What, why should this lift you up? He explains. 
For it is known that the way of wrestlers is that when one is gaining the upper hand, the other likewise strives to prevail with all the resources of his strength. Therefore, when the divine soul exerts itself and summons its strength for prayer, the animal soul also gathers strength to confuse her and topple her by means of a foreign thought of its own. The way of, of a wrestle is that there are certain points in a wrestle, those who are into wrestling will know this, anyone? Um, that when, when, in the midst of a wrestling, any type of, of uh, combat is that there are certain lulls in the combat where things are a bit quiet. But then when one side tries to attack, when one, one tr side rises up and tries to gain ground, tries to get an advantage, the other side reacts and responds. Then you, then you can't sit back. Then you have to respond and fight back. That's, that's the way of, a, of any combat, that a quiet moment can remain quiet as long as both sides are being quiet. But if one side is pushing, the other side is going to push back. And so too in our inner battle, that as long as we're going about our business, as long as, as we're just involved in, in, in our, our daily affairs, the animal soul is not threatened, is, is OK. As soon as we start some spiritual pursuit, as soon as we start communing with God, praying, doing something like that, what is that? That's the divine soul asserting itself. That's the divine soul expressing itself. That's, that is our holy side connecting to our holy source. And that's where the animal soul wakes up and throws at us whatever it can to assert its ground because it's feeling threatened. It's feeling that it's being pushed away. Our animal soul knows that if you have a good prayer session, it's in trouble. Because if you begin the day and you spend a few minutes praying, getting into the prayer, really feeling it, getting, creating a bit of a, an uplifting connection with God, if you have that just for a few minutes in the beginning of the day, you are going to have a day that is much more refined and elevated than it would have been otherwise. You're, it's going to be much harder for the animal soul for the rest of the day to pull you down, to make you feel negative about yourself, to, to skew you off your path and your mission, because once you've connected, once you've plugged in, so then there's a certain clarity you feel. There's a certain strength that you have, that you're able to face the, the day and its challenges with perspective, with faith, with confidence. If the prayer works, so then the day is going to go a certain way, and the animal soul does not want that. So the animal soul is rising up and counterattacking, and throwing distractions to you to try and drag you out of the prayer, to ruin it, to make it not work. And so this is great news. If, if you are having distracting thoughts in your prayer, that means your prayer is working. Something is happening here. You are, you are actually connecting. Something big is, is in the making, and that's why the animal soul has to react so strongly. It's almost like... If you don't have distracting thoughts when you pray, if there's no resistance, then we've got a question, are you actually there? Are you, are you really praying or are you just on autopilot? Is, is something happening? Because if there's no reaction from the animal soul, that means the divine soul hasn't done anything. You know, it's like, um, it's like you know, you have different people in a community and there are certain people who are controversial characters, who are people who cop a lot of flack, a lot of, a lot of uh, criticism. But it's only people who do stuff that are criticized. Somebody who does nothing is not criticized. If you're not in the public eye, if you're not trying to do anything, if you're not building anything, you're not, you're not touching anyone, you're not affecting anyone, so then no one's upset at you because you're not doing anything. But as soon as you try to do something, try to change something, try to build something, there are going to be detractors, there's going to be opposition. And that is not necessarily a sign that you're doing the wrong thing. It may be a sign you're doing the right thing. Obviously, depending on the circumstances, not everyone who has opposition is good. But if you don't have any opposition, it means you're not doing anything. There has to be some opposition to what you're doing. Otherwise, it means you're not actually doing. Here as well, if, you're, if your divine soul is starting to be active, the animal soul is going to react. That is a good sign. That means you're doing something. The animal soul is waiting to pounce as soon as it sees your divine soul lifting itself up. So the, the distracting thoughts in prayer are a good sign. It's good news. This, says Rabbi Shnazah this refutes the error commonly held by many people who mistakenly view the foreign thought as proof that their prayer is worthless 
For if one prayed as is fitting and proper, no foreign thoughts would have come to them. Many people think that if I can't concentrate for five minutes on my prayers, obviously I cannot pray. This is a big waste of time. If I cannot sit and just open the book and read the prayers and focus on that, so then I am just not made up for this. I'm not made for this. I just don't have the wherewithal. I don't have the power to pray. And so many people think that the distracting thoughts are proof that I'm not praying. It says Rabbi Shnei Zalman, it's the opposite. What they say would be true if there were only one single soul, both praying as well as thinking the foreign thoughts. Then, if you're just one singular soul and you can't pray, you're thinking foreign thoughts, so then you're not a good prayer. It's just not your thing. The real truth, however, is that there are two souls waging war one against the other in the person's mind, each one wishing to rule over him and pervade his mind exclusively. All thoughts of Torah and the fear of heaven come from the divine soul, while all mundane matters come from the animal soul, except that the divine soul is clothed in it. They're, they're intertwined with each other, but they're two distinct souls, that your thoughts that are distracting you are from the animal soul. The thoughts of connecting to God are from your divine soul. They're two separate souls fighting with each other. And so therefore, the distractions are a sign that there's something good happening, that you're actually on the right path. And so, the thought that suddenly comes to you that I'm so tired. When do we think we're tired? Our animal soul is just trying to distract us from what we're doing. This is in prayer. It's also in, in Torah study. When you're, when you're studying Torah, an elevated study, so that also, the animal soul doesn't like that. Even what we're doing now, the animal soul is not really very happy about this. The animal soul really did not want you to be here tonight. And now that you're here, really wants to take you away from this. Because this is exposing the animal soul. Everything that Tanya is telling us is threatening to the animal soul. If we get its machinations, if we start to figure out its, its scheme, so then we're going to start to beat it. And so our animal soul will do everything it can to stop us getting this. And so often it's as soon as this type of study, as soon as you start this, that you realize how tired you are or that you're hungry or how many things you need to do. Do you know what's on tomorrow? What am I doing here? How can I, I, I've got so much I have to worry about. And these thoughts will often come to you before you arrive at the class of how can I do it? And the parking's impossible. And there's, there's so many things that the animal soul will throw out to try and stop it happening because the animal soul knows it's going to be threatened. When you hear those thoughts, when those thoughts are coming to you, it means something good is happening. It means that there's, there's, the divine soul is getting an opening. And so the animal soul has to try and stop it. So rather than thinking this is a proof that I'm doing something that is not for me or that I'm wasting my time or I'm not made for this, on the contrary, you're doing something that is productive for the divine soul and so therefore there is resistance. The resistance is a good sign. So this is like the example of a person praying with devotion. While facing him, there stands a wicked heathen who chats and speaks to him in order to confuse him. Surely the thing to do in such a case would be not to answer him, good or evil, but rather to pretend to be deaf without hearing and to comply with the verse, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like, like unto him. The example he gives is, it's as if somebody else is trying to disturb what you're doing. You're, you're trying to pray and somebody else is coming and making fun of you. So what, should you interrupt your prayers and say, don't make fun of me? No, you, you ignore somebody who's making fun, who's trying to just, just get in the way. You ignore them completely. The animal soul is just like, a, like a, a foreign force trying to come into your divine soul and interrupt. Don't give it any attention. Don't, don't give it any credit. Just say, all you, could, all you should give it is the fact that it's making so much noise means that I'm doing something good. It means that I'm on the right path. That, that's the, all the attention that it deserves. Similarly, you must answer nothing nor engage in any argument or counter-argument with the foreign thought. For he who wrestles with a filthy person is bound to get himself dirty. If you start battling with the animal soul, you're going to also get dirty as well. Rather, adopt an attitude as if you neither know nor hear the thoughts that have arisen. Remove them from your mind and redouble your focus on the prayers. So you're trying to pray and suddenly you feel hungry. So don't start saying, okay, look, I am hungry. Okay, well, you know, so, you know what? That's not the topic now. Hunger is not what we're talking about now. Uh, that, you know, you, you suddenly remember that you owe somebody money or you remember the book that you borrowed from somebody six years ago, you never returned it. Now you think about it, you have to think about it now. It's funny that all other things that we're doing, we don't think about these things. 
when we're, when we're sitting in a restaurant reading through the menu, we're able to read through the entire menu without one distracting thought. Nothing pops into our head. When you're sitting at a dentist reading a stupid magazine, you're able to concentrate. But as soon as you start praying, you have to think about the money that you owe or, or, or the, the book that you have to return. It's not the time. I'm not, I'm not going to engage in it. I'm not pl planning anything. No plans for the future while I'm praying. Nothing outside of the, the spiritual world that I'm in. All I'm doing is observing that this thought that's being thrown at me is just an attempt to derail my divine soul from doing something holy. And so the best sign that my prayers are getting somewhere is the resistance that the animal soul throws at me, the distracting thoughts. That, that is actually a reason to be joyous, to be happy that you are, you are achieving something spiritual now. That is already a connection. You're, you're doing something good. So our thoughts should not bring us down. We should not be disappointed. We should not feel that we're not praying, that we're not spiritual. On the contrary, it's, it's a sign that we're getting somewhere. So in conclusion, these two chapters, 27 and 28, teach us that bad thoughts are good news. Why? First of all, they're an opportunity to do a mitzvah. When you have a bad thought, a negative thought, a negative impulse, you have an opportunity to, the, to do the mitzvah of not following it, of not going after that mitzvah, which only we, Bainanim, we people who are average strugglers, we have the opportunity, unlike a tzaddik who, is a, who, who never has these temptations, we who have temptations are able to not follow them. That's our mitzvah, that's, that's our good deed that we do. If you're surprised and disappointed that you have these thoughts, then you just don't know who you are. You're just not aware that you're not a tzaddik and never going to be a tzaddik. So don't be disappointed or surprised by the temptations that, that, that come and arise in your, in your head and the bad thoughts. Embrace the fact in, that you're in a struggle and this is your life mission. Embrace that, that this is what you're about. You're a person who will always have temptations, always have negative thoughts, always have challenging issues coming up within you and your mission is to control them, to subdue them. You're never gonna transform it but you can control it. If you find it hard to focus on prayer, that's great news. It means that you're really getting somewhere in your prayers. That, that's why the, the resistance is coming, because you're moving, because your soul is, is moving somewhere. That is, that is great news. And so don't engage in those thoughts. Just push the thoughts away and get back to the prayer. Every time you do that, you have won, won, won a victory for good over evil. Every single time you push a thought aside and stick back to the prayers, every single time a temptation comes to you and you overcome it and you say, no, I'm not going to do it, every time those, that animal comes to try and knock you off from your spiritual path and you say, thank you, but I'm not going to listen to you, every time you do that, you have flexed your iskafia muscle, you have, you have flexed that muscle of self-control, you have banished evil from a part of the world and allowed goodness to shine there. And there is nothing more powerful than that. There's nothing more powerful than overcoming evil and doing good, putting good where evil wanted to be, replacing the darkness with, with a bit of light. That's something that only we strugglers can do. The tzaddik never has an opportunity to do that because they're in the world of light, of holiness. We're the ones who are in the, in the world of darkness that can bring light into that place. And every victory, no matter how small it is, is a huge victory for goodness in the world. Okay, we're going to stop there. Um, if there are any, any questions, people are welcome to uh, stay back with questions. Just quickly, next week we're going to continue. Um, how do you unblock a frozen heart? We spoke uh, in chapter 26 of how real sadness is not an emotion. It's where the heart is unemotional, is blocked out, is like frozen like a stone. How do you unblock that? How do you move ahead when your emotions are frozen? And how do you bring joy back to a, a heart that has gone silent? That we're going to talk about, God willing, next week.